morning everyone. Uh, so yesterday we looked at the formula for heat transfer. Uh, heat is uh, energy that's being passed or something that's hot to cold. Uh, we saw the difference between uh, using MC delta T. Uh, whenever the temperature does change, uh, the heat actually depends on how much matter, how much mass I'm trying to heat it up. It depends on the specific heat. Uh, the specific heat of water uh, is given on the data booklet, 4.18. Some materials are easier to heat up, some materials are harder to heat up, uh, and as you deliver more heat, you'd expect there to be a bigger uh, temperature change. Uh, that was more so uh, sort of a physics context because I have just artificially heated up that block here. What we're going to do is we're going to apply that formula, Q is equal to mc delta t, but more so in today's lesson here on the, in the chemistry context here. This is actually going to be the first way we're going to find enthalpy change. Uh, let me just actually start there. We're going to spend the better part of this chapter here, about maybe um, five, six lessons or so. We're going to be looking at this main term here, this guy here called enthalpy change. So if you can just sort of uh, remind yourselves from the first lesson, enthalpy was talking about the heat energy in the system. Remember, no matter how good my technology gets, there's way too many particles, there's way too many ways energy can be stored, even heat energy can be stored. I can't get an absolute number, but what I care is I care, what's the difference? As I went from reactants to products, what's the delta H? Do I overall, as products, have more energy or less energy than before, which is why we ended up with those terms, uh, endothermic and exothermic. Although energy is conserved inside my entire universe all at once, because my system is a specific uh, looking at particles, specific bonds that are breaking and forming, I may actually have an energy change. And basically in my expressions here, we had reactants become products. Essentially, so far I've just been saying plus heat. Essentially, we're trying to figure out for a reaction, in this case heat is on the right-hand side, so hopefully you can say exothermic here. Essentially, I'm looking for ways to actually figure out what this number is. Does it release 10 kilojoules? Does it release 200 kilojoules? And we're actually going to find six or seven different ways of finding this number. Um, depending on the question itself, uh, it should be clear sort of which method we're going to use, but uh, again, we're just going to sort of step through basically lesson by lesson. We're going to walk through one new way of finding delta H. All right, so that's the emphasis. I may not know exactly what the energy before is, nor the energy afterwards, but I can tell over the course of the reaction we end up losing this heat here. So just keep a notion of enthalpy change. That's our main concept. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce to you the first method uh, of uh, calculating this enthalpy change. And this first method here is something we call calorimetry. Careful, different from colorimetry. Colorimetry was like chapter 3, dealing with absorbance and wavelength, things like that. In this case here, it's based on the root word calorie, so it's based on heat transfers. So this is a nice uh, technique in chemistry. Technique used to, keyword here is experimentally. Let's do this in the lab. A right. uh, technique used to experimentally determine or measure or find, okay, uh, determine the enthalpy of reaction. That's all they're going to call it, enthalpy of reaction. And what they mean, again, enthalpy we know is going to be H. And we're looking at the change. When I compare final minus initial, uh, how does the enthalpy of products compare to the enthalpy of reactants? There's going to be a lot of formulas uh, in upcoming lessons here. Sometimes, every now and then, it may actually switch to reactants minus products. That doesn't change the fact here. We are always looking for delta H. We're always looking for the before and after. Right, here's my potential energy diagram, H, and we have a reaction. I'm looking for sort of at the beginning and at the end. I want to know what this change was. Going from reactants to products, is it positive, is it negative? How much did I drop by? Is it negative 10, negative 50? I want to know this delta H. It is always going to be products minus reactants. It's just that with our upcoming ways of actually finding delta H, sometimes formula-wise, the numbers you put reactants minus products, but we are still interested in energy change for the forward reaction. Just before we work through a question here, there's a couple of different setups because this is experimental. And the setups really depend on what type of reaction that you're doing. Some reactions are not safe to do in um, one of these setups here. So uh, let's start off here. We can do the first one here as what's called a foam cup or styrofoam cup calorimeter. A foam cup calorimeter, the type of reactions that are really convenient for here is this is uh, convenient for solution style reactions, dissolving reactions, neutralization reactions. Uh, when we do um, the worked example later on, it will be this sort of setup. So basically what's happening here is I'm going to take a styrofoam cup, I'm going to have maybe some powder inside or even the liquid first, doesn't really matter. 
and basically what's going to happen is the powder is going to dissolve. We'll come back in a later lesson to figure out another way of calculating the energy change, but so far for today, it's just experimental. I drop in a certain amount of powder, I dissolve into this liquid here, I'm going to stick my thermometer. I know my thermometer always measures the temperature of the surroundings. It's never microscopic enough to actually measure the particles. But what I can infer is, say my surroundings, say my thermometer goes from this reading here and my temperature reading goes up, if the overall solution is getting hotter, I would then imply the system has actually cooled down. So I can sort of infer the opposite, whatever I'm feeling, the system had did the opposite. Uh, what's so important about a foam cup here, we saw a little bit in yesterday's lesson, heat loss to the surroundings will always be the biggest uh, problem. Uh, so foam is a nicer insulator, so a good insulator. It's not perfect, right? we, don't, we can mimic a isolated system, but we're never going to get a 100% uniform um, isolated system. Good insulator, and it's going to have a negligible heat capacity. Pretty much any component that I add to something experimentally, uh, the water can soak up the heat, the styrofoam can soak up the heat, but really the styrofoam really doesn't uh, run into it. It doesn't interfere. Uh, obviously, in this case here, we were going to do a lab here where it was actually open to the environment like this, um, but if you can put like a foam sort of type lid and you can stick a thermometer inside there, that would just make the system a little bit uh, better as well. So useful for solutions, useful for neutralizations, things like that. Uh, in fact, uh, in, on this note here, I'm going to show you experimentally how this uh, ends up working out. So let's imagine I was just plotting. This again is going to be a temperature time graph. Um, so uh, in this chapter here, your their two common axes are going to be sort of let, what's the enthalpy as the reaction occurs or a temperature time blot. We did this uh, using sort of the temperature plateaus from last day's lesson. Uh, what we were going to do here is we were actually going to start off with the water, stick your thermometer inside, and what the thermometer is going to do, it's going to sample the temperature at any given time. So let's say at 0 degrees, we happen to be at 20 degrees, so room temperature. Because I'm just sort of running the clock here, a little bit later it's still 20, a little bit later it's still 20. Let's say 20 is my room temperature at that point. Once I have a nice baseline, right, this is my starting, so we'll call it a baseline. I can even call this my TI because that's my starting temperature. Once I have my baseline here, I'm going to slowly drop in the powder. It's only when the particles start breaking up, that's when I actually get my heat change. So far in my directions that I've drawn them, heat is actually lost by the particles to the water. So what's going to happen here is my thermometer, it was just minding its own business, it was 20, it was 20, it was 20. As I start dropping in my powder, this one here will just actually gradually heat up. It's going to heat up to some maximum temperature. I actually want to know how hot does it get to, because that is a measure of how much this amount of powder has actually dissolved to actually um, heat up the water. So it's going to heat up some, some peak temperature. But as you know, if I did this experimentally here, once you hit some peak here, it's going to gradually try to equilibrate. It's going to gradually try to come back to room temperature. In fact, it doesn't heat up uniformly and then comes back to room temperature. In fact, as it, the particles, so I drop in particles here. So the reaction starts at this time. As I drop in the particles, it actually heated up. It's already cooling down. Heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. It's actually constantly trying to cool down, although the heating up is happening quicker, so I am seeing this peak here, but gradually it does follow this sort of cooling down trend. What I want is I want the delta H for the reaction. I want, as this equation goes, what's the max amount of heat that it gets? I want to ignore this sort of cooling down, cooling down, cooling down, cooling down. And the problem here is, even though no matter how quickly you stir and whatever and try to break out the powder, your reaction actually took this much time to actually occur. The reaction started here, the reaction ended. How do I know the reaction ended? Well, if the reaction was exothermic, it's heating it up, I'm not seeing any more heating. So I know it definitely heated. In this case here, it took a finite amount of time to actually run the reaction. So if it weren't for this sort of constant cool down, cool down, cool down, cool down kind of business here, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to wait experimentally. Right? This is a technique that we do. On paper 3 of your IB exam, they can give you a sample graph like this. Sometimes they even give you the equation of this line here. Because what you're going to do is you're going to use a ruler, and you're actually going to extrapolate. Hopefully you get a nice linear trend, linear drop here back to room temperature. You're going to extrapolate this back, and you're going to actually figure out, hypothetically, if we weren't worried about the heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down, whatever. Hypothetically, if the reaction didn't take this amount of time, if it all occurred instantaneously, all at once, how much hotter would that uh, final temperature would have been based on this curve that we have? So if we're given the option, 
If we don't want to measure this as a defined temperature, I can extrapolate that back, make sure you use a ruler, I can find whatever this temperature is, and that's actually going to be your final temperature. You still might have an error bar on the temperature, right? depending on how easy it is to extrapolate, you can still get an error in temperature, but what I want to show you here is, overall, the delta T that I'm going to be using for my calculations later on, the delta T is actually larger than what the delta T was uh, shown on the graph. So just look out for that here, uh, that there is how you find delta T. Uh, I'm going to walk you through, once we show the other two setups, I'll walk you through a worked out example. How do we get from delta T and how do we actually work our way back to delta H? Uh, before we get to that, I want to show you two other setups here. Second setup here, we're going to call it a balm calorimeter. Let's find this as a funny name. Still an experimental setup, still we're going to try to find the heat transfer, try to find out end or exo. This one here is more vigorous, a violent uh, reaction. This one here is convenient for combustion style problems. It's convenient for burning. If the reaction that I want to find the delta H it happens to be like a burning reaction, I don't want to do it in a foam cup. I might accidentally melt the foam and burn and cause some safety hazard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it up in another system here. This one here is going to be sort of a cup in a cup. I'm going to have an inside cup. So the inside vessel, the inside container, that's where I'm going to put the thing I'm burning. So maybe I have methanol or some fuel here. I'm going to do the burning. I'm going to set up in such a way that I can trigger the burn whenever I want. And in this case here, the inside vessel, what you want to know is the inside vessel is going to be something that's strong. So it can withstand uh, the heat and withstand the sort of the, the fire itself. It's strong. But surprisingly, this time I want it to be conductive. I thought we want the container to be insulative. I thought I want all the heat to transfer inside. It's again a problem. I'm worried about this fire here being too violent, too vigorous. I'm not going to risk sticking my thermometer inside here. I'm going to stick this inside vessel here into an outer container. The outer container here I actually fill with water. Uh, a dual wall thermos sort of uh, mimics this as well. So my outer container here, outside container, in this case here, I just fill it with water, and I put my thermometer safely just inside the water. I might need a fan of some sort to actually be swirling and stirring the water so it evenly distributes here. But the reason why I want it to be conductive for the inside is I want all the heat to very, very quickly go out into the water. I don't want any of the heat to actually stay in here because I want my thermometer to be able to measure some maximum temperature that my water eventually gets to. We're using water again because it's really plentiful. Also from yesterday's lesson, a relatively big specific heat, so it's relatively high constant for it to actually heat up. So in this case here, I want it strong. I want it to withstand the fire, but I do want it conductive so that I can transfer heat out all in an instant. Combustion reactions do happen very quickly, but even if there was a sort of equilibrating to room temperature, I can still do this extrapolating and I can figure out, well, how much hotter would the temperature would have gotten were it not for this uh, constant equilibrating back to room temperature. So that's a bomb calorimeter here. It's useful, although it's pretty equipment intensive. Also very expensive. Also it takes a while to set up because you have to somehow trigger a mechanism to burn and refill the water every time. So sort of the um, compromise between those two here, they're going to call this one here a spirit burner. Spirit burner always looks to me like a sort of oil lamp. This one here is convenient also for sort of burning reaction, specifically here, specific for burning spirits or alcohols. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to have a old school oil lamp. I'm going to have the fuel, this time instead of the oil, maybe it's my alcohol here. So alcohol as fuel. And I'm interested here is as I'm burning this alcohol, how much energy is being released. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to have a wick of some sort. It's going to slowly uh, absorb the oil and alcohol upwards. Uh, a lot easier to strike because I can see the wick here. I can just take a match to it. Again, the biggest problem here is going to be heat loss in the environment. You'll see it very easily in this setup here. But what I'm going to do is sort of this same setup. I'm not going to risk sticking my thermometer in the alcohol or any close to the fire. I'm going to stick it close to a beaker. The beaker I'm going to fill with water, and I'm going to stick my thermometer in the water. Because I can always infer if my water heats up, well, all the energy had to have come from the oil or had to have come from the alcohol in this example. And I can extrapolate back, well, the reaction was actually burning the alcohol. It does the opposite of what I'm sensing on my thermometer. We see, based on how close you can put the speaker here, heat loss of the surroundings, again, is always going to be the biggest problem. The nice thing about this one here, again, not as expensive and equipment intensive as a bomb calorimeter, you don't actually have to burn up the complete fuel. 
in this case here, maybe I start off with, I don't know, 10 grams of fuel. I strike the uh, Bunsen burner. I let it go for about t uh, 20 minutes or so. And maybe I still have 4 grams of fuel left. So be it. Then it's just going to be, oh, I actually use 6 grams of fuel. I use 6 grams burned. Uh, in my calculations. So you don't actually need to burn up all your fuel and it's a little bit easier to work with than uh, the bomb thermometer. These are the three common setups. You'll notice that all three setups are experimental. Uh, all three setups are using a thermometer to try to find this delta T. Uh, we're going to actually see a worked out example. How do I get from delta T uh, back to um, the delta H that we want? Uh, we want reactions in general to occur really, really quickly because, for example, so far I've done exothermic reactions. I want to see how hot could this have gotten if it wasn't constantly equilibrating. Same story with endothermic, except this graph here would actually drop. I'm going to worry about it coming back upwards. How cold could it have gotten if the reaction all occurred at an instant, if the burning was happening all at once and superconductive, uh, and basically uh, all the transfer happens all at once. Here's the sort of order that we're going to take it in, and we're going to see a worked example of this. I'm going to take the delta T that comes from my thermometer. That uh, it's because of the water or whatever solvent that I'm using. That's because that got heated up. That's so far measured in degrees Celsius or in Kelvin. I'm going to use our formula, Q is equal to MC delta T. This will worry about, well, how much water and what's the constant for water here. That's going to actually help us convert Kelvin into the unit's joules. It's going to convert us back into the heat term. Remember, this so far is talking about the water. This is so far talking about the surroundings. We're going to then flip the sign. We're going to say, because we're interested in the reaction, the system does the opposite to the surroundings. Uh, sometimes when people look at this, they always think, oh, system has to be excellent. No, it just has to be negative of whatever it is now. Sure, if the, if the surroundings got heated up, if it was exo, if it's a negative of a negative, that means the system actually gained heat. It's just going to be the opposite of whatever the surroundings did. So let's just say released here. So flip the sign. And then one thing that may not be super clear, that already is the energy change. That's sort of the enthalpy as the reaction proceeded. Did I gain heat? Did I lose heat? But the thing that's not uh, super clear here and as a last step, this was all experimental. This was the heat for dissolving exactly your amount for this experiment. This is the heat for burning your amount of uh, fuel, your amount of alcohol. What I want instead is when I calculate delta H, I want it in such a way that when I have reactions become products, if I have a heat term, I want that number, whatever the number is, I want it to be kilojoules per mole of reaction. I want it to be every time you run this statement, I release 10. You run twice of the statement, I release 20. I want it to be per mole of reaction, I don't want it to be specific to your exact number. So what we're going to do on that note here, you can think about delta H here, it will be in units kilojoules per mole of reaction. And all we're going to have to do is we're going to figure out based on my particles, how many moles am I actually reacting. And quite simply here, we're going to then take Q of the system, and I'm going to divide it by N, and N is the moles of reaction. So maybe my reaction was 2 moles. You got this amount of heat for 2 moles, I divide it by 2, then I get the heat for 1 mole. Or maybe my reaction was only half a mole. That's the amount of heat I got for half a mole. By doing the division, I can figure out how much it is for 1 mole. You can actually summarize this uh, part here. You can actually go delta H, therefore, is equal to the negative mc delta T over n. That's going to be our sort of calorimetry way. We see starting from delta T, we see us punching it through mc delta T, we see us flipping the sign and then dividing by n. So if you like formulas, you can do it that way. All right. So let's just work through one uh, worked example here. This one here is a little bit longer of a question. So just be prepared for this. We're going to do a uh, neutralization style question. So what I'm going to do here, when 200 mils of 1.5 uh, molar NaOH is mixed, into 100 mils of 3 molar HCl, the temperature changes, right? That's what the thermometer is reading experimentally. Temperature changes from, uh, let's say, 15 degrees to 21.5 degrees. I'm totally making up these numbers here. If you really looked up the uh, neutralization and it's probably different. Uh, I wrote this out how you would see in a sort of regular uh, grade 12 problem. Uh, 
Uh, remember, IB prefers instead of milliliters, IB would prefer to say centimeter cube. Instead of this molar that we started seeing in the um, first chapter, it would rather say mole per dm cube. Just make sure you can uh, read it differently. Um, I'm going to give you the equation here. This is a simple acid base neutralization. Our NaOH is going to run into HCl, so one to one ratio. It's going to form our NaCl and it's going to be forming water. What we're interested in this question here is we're interested in finding the delta H. Sorry, a little bit more of the question. I want you to determine or calculate, calculate the enthalpy, assuming the density, uh, assuming the density and the specific heat of the mixture is 1.04 gram per mil and 4.20 joule per gram kelvin. I want you to just get familiar with the language. Sometimes it will say respectively, and respectively just means sort of in the order that I gave you. I'm saying assuming density and specific heat. Well, density is going to be the first number, specific heat is going to be the second number. In fact, most questions, they won't give you this latter part. Most questions we're going to actually assume. So usually, usually we assume a dilute solution. So even though um, realistically here my experiment involves, I'm going to actually have NaOH particles swimming around in water. I'm going to actually add in HCl particles swimming in water. I'm going to assume that pretty much most of the um, system here is actually just water. I'm going to assume that it's dilute. So usually if I don't have the actual mixture density, the mixture of specific heat, usually assume dilute solution. So the density is just 1, right? that's for water, and 4.18. So I'm not going to use that this time because I actually were, was given new numbers. I've given, oh, for the mixture, yeah, you actually do have HCLs and NOHs here. The density is slightly off from 1. The specific heat is slightly off from uh, 4.18. So if I'm given them, obviously use them. But otherwise, you just pretend that dilute. Otherwise, we're just always going to pretend the water is the solvent and you use water's numbers. All right, so there's the question here. This looks very similar to a mixing style question. It will have to do with moles, and we'll do some of those calculations again. Um, the thing we assumed back in our chapter one was we assumed that the two swimmers, when I mixed the orange juice and apple juice, we assumed that they didn't care about each other. We assumed that, sure, the total volume increase, both of them get diluted, which is true, but this time we actually involve a reaction. This time, the HCl that I end up adding in and the NaOH, when they find each other, they actually react in a one-to-one -one ratio. They actually kill each other off. So the number of swimmers, the number of particles in the solution, although the overall mass is conserved, the overall amount of base and acid particles I have will actually be decreased. So this is more so, it's more than just a mixing style question. Uh, let's just sort of work our way through. For all calorimetry questions, if you're lost, I know some of the, it's a really sort of lots of text here, just try to do that ordering. Start off with delta T. Start off with what the thermometer says. Delta T, if you've forgotten, is going to be final minus initial. This time I went from 15 degrees. I'm assuming that's initial. I'm assuming they did all that extrapolating and they got the final temperature to be 21.5. All I'm going to do is final temperature minus initial temperature. Technically, this should be Kelvin, but because this formula, again, is delta T here, we know we've gained by 6.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, remember, any temperature change they give us is they said, surroundings get hotter. So you can already conclude for me, this one here should be an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction, heat exits, and it's the water that soaks up all the energy change. If you touch this uh, styrofoam cup from the outside, uh, we're doing this in a foam cup converter because it's easy enough just to mix these solutions, no burning or anything like that. Uh, the foam would just trap the heat inside. So I have the delta T, I have this sort of heat transfer. I now want to sort of work my way to joules. So the next part here is, Q is equal to MC delta T. Let's figure out how much matter and material that I'm actually mixing in together. Here's the part that the mass would have been really hard. Because the mass used to be, I used to have first thing different amounts, right? The molarities were different between acid and base. The particles themselves have a different molar mass. This one's about 40 gram per mil. This one's only about 36 gram per mil. They then convert over to NaCl, which also has a different uh, density, a different molar mass. Mass would have been horrendously hard to do. And yet, we're going to simplify things here. Because I started off with 200 and 100, overall, the final container should be 300 mils. We would pretend that it was dilute if I wasn't given density. If I am given a density that's slightly off from water, use it. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to worry about how far the reaction has gone. I'm just going to say I have 300 mils worth of this mixture. The density I was given was 1.04. I would usually just use 1 there. I would just pretend that it's water if I wasn't given that density. Again, for specific heat, I would have used the density of just pure water 4.18, but because they give me to me a slightly different number because of those added particles, I'm just going to use 4.20 joule per gram Kelvin, and then we're going to go up by 6.5 steps on the Celsius scale, while 6.5 steps on the Celsius scale is the same 6.5 steps on the Kelvin scale. So you're noticing all the other units cancel out, and we end up being able to convert our delta T. Because my water has heated up by this amount, I can figure out how many joules was actually released. So I'm getting a random number here, A517.6, and that's joules. Uh, if you want to convert that there, we're talking 8.5 kilojoules. That's the amount of heat that was absorbed by the uh, thermometer. Right? This is the surroundings. So what I'm going to do here is quite simply here, because I want to f figure out what the particles themselves did, if my surroundings has gained 8.5, I'm just going to flip that to a negative here negative 8.5 kilojoules, that's because my system has lost 8.5. Again, we are under the impression that everything was 100% efficient, the reaction occurred all at once, uh, there was no equilibrium back to room temperature, but definitely the opposite. I'm never microscopic enough to figure out what my particles themselves are actually doing, uh, but what I'm doing here is I'm actually just doing the opposite. If my temperature goes up, it's because my particles have lost this energy. This is basically the heat that's evolved, sometimes they use that terminology here, uh, this is the heat evolved from the particles. Evolved just means it's released, okay, it's let go from the particles. So that sort of corresponds with me starting out high and ending out low in terms of energy. But remember, this had to do specifically with R amounts. For my experiment, I used 200 and this molarity. What if I did an experiment with 400 or 500 or different molarities and whatever? I want to end up calculating a delta H that only depends on the reaction itself, Sure, I can use the numbers that I had earlier, but I want to eventually divide it. I want it to be intensive. I want it to describe the energy change every time you run the statement, every time you run one mole of reaction. So here we'll do the work on the side here. We now need to find moles again. Okay. So hopefully this doesn't bring back bad memories here. I have 200 and I have 1.5. Let's first find how many moles of HCl I'm reacting. 200 would have been 0 0.200 liters. 1.5 molar would have been mole per liter. I go 0.2 times 1.5. This gives me here 0 0.300 moles. That's the number of particles of acid. I kept things fairly similar here. Moles of base. Um, oh, sorry, did I mix those two up? Yes, sorry. Uh, the 200 was NaOH. The other one was HCl. So let's just flip that around here. So NaOH, and this one here was HCl. Uh, so this one here, I added 100 milliliters. This one here is more concentrated. And I kept things similar because these things here are actually equal in number. So the moles of particles I'm actually reacting is going to be 0.3. And now I'm pretty much done. Now I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to take the negative 8.5. If you have the entire number in your calculator, even better. I think it was 8.51. Yeah, 8.52. Okay. Negative 8.52, that's how much energy was released. That's how much energy that was actually evolved from my exact experiment, but I'm going to divide it by n, and therefore it will rescale this energy term so that it applies to my equation. The question here is, which mole do I put in? I have 0.3 of the base, I have 0.3 of the acid. Do not do 0.6, because what you need to remember is in the recipe, the NaOH and the HCl get used up at the same time. If I have 0.3 of this guy, 0.3 of this guy, by the time I use up 0.3, in a one-to-one -one ratio, it ends up using exactly 0.3 of the other chemical as well. So both of them perfectly neutralized. They're not going to have any limited excess. Just pick one. I'm going to pick, let's say, NaOH for argument's sake here. That's moles of NaOH. But I can look back at my reaction and I can say, well, if I really wanted that moles of reaction, if I really want every time you run this statement once and I want the energy term on this side here, it is just one mole of NaOH. I can do that for every one mole of NaOH that does correspond to one molar reaction. Okay. So let's go negative 8.52. I'm going to be off by a little bit of rounding. I'm getting the delta H, although it was for my exact experiment with 0.3, uh, this delta H now is going to be 28.4 kilojoules per mole. And now that number is intensive. That number relates to my whole equation. So when HCl runs into NaOH, when it becomes NaCl and water, 
Because my delta H is negative, negative delta H means XO, and XO means the heat term is on the right-hand side. So we went through all that work, we ran an experiment, we tracked temperature changes, and we now were able to figure out how much energy, not just that it's going to be on the right-hand side, but how much energy every time you run this statement, you get 28.4 release. You run this statement twice, double that. Ten times, ten times that. Right? So uh, a couple little uh, caveats and a little bit of changes here just to finish off. Um, in this case here, it was easy because there was no limiting. What if there was a limiting? So what if I did exactly the same question? What if, like, sort of I was at this point here, I'm ready to divide by mo. What if, let's do a couple what ifs. So what if, when I calculated my numbers here, what if my NaOH, 0 0.300 moles, what if I did everything the same, but what if the HCl was actually 0 0.400 moles? In that case there, the question is, well, which mole should I use? Uh, long story short here, we're going to end up using the limiting. Use the limiting for when I do that Q over N formula. Because what's going to happen here is these react currently in a 1 to 1 ratio. By the time I use up 0 0.03, oh, sorry, 0 0.3, uh, this one here would have used up 0.3, sure, I'm going to have 0 0.100 moles left of HCl, but without the NaOH, once the limiting has run out, the reaction cuts off, right? That's, why, that's the reason why we say limiting. It stops the reaction. The only reason why I was delivering 28.4 anyways was because HCl ran to NaOH. Once the NaOH is run out, I don't care how much HCl you have left over, so make sure you use limiting. In this case here, there was no limiting, so I was open to using either of them. It's even possible that the mole ratio might be different, so let's do everything the same. Let's say it's H2SO4 and NaOH, uh, Na2SO4. Right. So this time, the mole ratio is different. It's going to be a 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 kind of ratio. What if I sort of avoided this sort of limiting problem? What if my NOH here was, uh, let's keep that the same as 0 0.300, right? I'm going to assume that's still the limiting, so how much H2SO4 would I need? Right, we're just following the mole ratio here. That means I would need to set up my H2SO4. Because of the mole ratio here is actually a 1 to 2 ratio, this actually generates two parts H+. plus. So it generates twice as much H+, plus. I only need 0 0.150 moles of this. Now. When you're looking at this, you might be like, well, neither of these are limiting. By the time this one runs out, we've completely used out is. Wouldn't this give you a different delta H depending on which chemical that you use? Let's try it out. Again, these are just some what ifs for you here. The delta H that we wanted was uh, negative 8.52. Let's imagine using our NaOH, so divided by 0 0.300 moles of NaOH. Right? Or I can use H2SO4, negative 8.52. Surely, if you divide it by 0 0.150 moles, that's a different number. That's going to be a different delta H. Here's where that molar reaction helps you again. The molar reaction says, well, in my new equation, every time you run this statement once, yes, you only use one mole of H2SO4. So one mole of H2SO4 is one mole of reaction. But if you run that statement once, you actually use two parts NaOH, we actually gain our factor of two back here. NaOH for every mole of reaction, if you work out that math, we're going to end up with the same number on both sides. 8.52 divide 0.3 times 2, this gives you negative 56.8. Different from earlier probably, uh, actually no, same. Um, but in this case here, we are definitely going to use the limiting because the limiting will stop the reaction. Okay, maybe I should write that down for you here. Uh, the reaction stops releasing heat when the limiting runs out, right? so that's always true. Uh, and in this case here, the reason why we want moles of reaction uh, is because of this possible mole ratio problem here. I want to have a term here, this sort of plus 56.8. It's plus on the right-hand side because it's exo. I just usually write kilojoules here. I understand that's going to be per mole. Um, the reason why it's per mole is then I can say, OK, I can read that statement. One mole will give me 56.8, or I need two moles to give me 56.8, or one mole of this gives me 56.8. I want this to be moles of reaction so that not only is it no longer specific to my question, it now belongs to the entire equation. There's one last little what if question. Um, not so much in this problem here. This problem, because everything mixes very nicely, we just took the total mass, oh, we make 300 milliliters. Let's just take another look at the styrofoam cup sort of calorimeter here. Just a comment on when you're trying to do Q is equal to MC delta T. When you try to find this mass here, 
for a foam cloud calorimeter here, uh, usually the chemistry is the particles end up dissolving. So what I'm going to have is I'm going to have mass of powder and I'm going to have mass of sort of the liquid. In this case here, the reaction is just the powder actually dissolving. But because the powder actually powders and dissolves into liquid, I would usually say here, if the solid dissolves, if it's soluble, I would usually take mass of the powder plus mass of the liquid. So it's actually the combined mass. Let's say I have, you'll see this on your worksheet here. Let's say your question is 25 grams of powder dissolving into 225 uh, grams of liquid. Because there is actually 25 grams of powder, it dissolves into it. It makes a total solution of 250 grams to actually heat up. In that case there, I'd actually add the two. If the thing doesn't dissolve, like yesterday's example, we had a hot aluminum block. That aluminum block here has nothing to do. The block here is not going to dissolve any which. It's just going to transfer its heat to the liquid. So in this case here, if it doesn't dissolve, if no, uh, I would just use the mass of the liquid. I would treat that as more a sort of bomb kilometer style question. It's like a vessel in a vessel. The inner container doesn't really matter. All I care is how much water is on the right hand side. So there's one feature here. In both cases there, whether you add the powder or you don't add the powder, when you then go delta H is equal to Q over N, uh, make sure the N is just the moles from the powder because the reaction was just the dissolving of the material, although we had added it for the amount of temperature that actually heats up, uh, when I actually divide by how much chemical it's actually dissolving, it's actually just this moles. Take the mass, divide it by the mole mass, just of the chemical rather than the liquid itself. Okay? So hopefully you can practice a few questions and that should clarify a few things. Thanks guys.